Their saving grace was the grain provided by the sorcerer's kingdom, the grain that was being shipped from the kingdom's warehouses to the holy kingdom through land and sea routes. An absolutely brilliant plan, Zanak thought. In such dire straits, they had no time for scruples about where the food came from, even if it was from one of the undead. If it were us providing the food aid instead, the goodwill that the sorcerer king has been receiving would have undoubtedly been ours. But, there's no way we could do that in these conditions. What if that battle never happened? No, at the bare minimum, if Yaldabaoth had not plundered all kinds of resources during the chaos in the royal capital, they would at least be in a better position than they were now. If they had been the ones to provide the Holy Kingdom with food aid, there would be no way that Undead's reputation would be as good as it is now. But that was not what happened. After receiving news of the new king's coronation, the diplomat sent by the kingdom was given the cold shoulder, according to reports afterward. This wasn't a cold war caused by national policies that antagonized neighboring countries. The relationship between the two countries had never been this bad during the reign of the late Holy Queen, Calcabaceres. Perhaps relations began souring before the grain shortage, back when the kingdom refused to provide military support against Jeldabiot's invasion of the Holy Kingdom. That might have dealt a fatal blow to their relationship. Of course, sending aid at that time was completely out of the question. After all, it had been an even more chaotic time for the kingdom, due to the heavy losses inflicted by the powerful magic of the Sorcerer King, Ainzulgaon. In addition, they had lost some of their most celebrated warriors, the most important of which was the warrior Captain Gaza Stronov, famed for being the strongest in the entire kingdom. What aid could they have provided against such a powerful demon at that time? Whatever they could say now would only sound like some bitter excuse from a heartless kingdom, but any other country in the same position as the kingdom that received such a plea for help would respond in the same way. Only the sorcerer's kingdom sent both military and domestic aid, so the kingdom paled in comparison. In fact, the Northern Holy Kingdom had already become quite favorably inclined towards the Sorcerer's Kingdom, according to the diplomats. Problem after problem without solutions caused a delay in responding. It was at this moment when he could finally see the bigger picture and the equally bigger problem. Though this seemed to be the confluence of numerous coincidences, the situation could give one the false impression that everything was connected. No, could it be? Onisama. Oh? Oi, sister. I can hear you alright, no need to shout. I'm not that old. Because you've ignored your own sister who's standing right here in front of you to drift off into your own thoughts, I'll create some nasty memories of you as revenge. Or were you thinking about something? Nothing, just being a bit too paranoid. Renner turned towards him, her eyes filled with pity. I'm not too sure, but that has to be it. You talk about negative things all the time, so naturally, every one of your trains of thought would inevitably veer towards the worst case scenarios. That made sense. Maybe. Hmm, that has to be it. About the Holy Kingdom, the schism between North and South means they're only a step away from a civil war, right? If that's the case, then which side will win? Though the exhausted North doesn't seem to have a fighting chance at all. Well, perhaps. The fact that someone of great renown from the North died is an influential factor. After all, that female paladin died too. I don't know much about that. Was it someone famous? MHM. From what I heard she could be tied with our warrior captain. She visited our kingdom once, it's a shame we couldn't meet. Skipping the normal sequence of meetings to grant immediate audience to an unofficial envoy was not appropriate for both parties. The royal family would be looked down upon if the meeting came too early. By the time diplomats made that judgment they had already left the capital. If they knew what they do now, they should have set up a meeting with her no matter what. Perhaps it could have helped them gain a potential backup option for the future. Back then, your judgment was diplomatically correct. If it wasn't for you telling me not to do it all the time, I would have thought that it was not that big of a deal to meet them. Having the king meet them right away would have definitely been inappropriate, but if a prince did so, it should have been fine. Wasn't it only Sama who made the final decision himself? Renner pouted. It was an expression cute enough to easily win over the heart of any man, a countless number of people had already fallen victim to it. Oni Sama is the current successor to the throne, but not everyone approves of you behind closed doors. Any possible cause of gossip, however small, must be avoided. It would trouble me a lot if you don't secure the throne. Oh, and causing a rebellion right now would be a problem as well. If that happens, you wouldn't be able to fulfill your promise. Hmm, <laughs> that's true. She did not disguise her intentions at all, but it was convincing nonetheless. Hmm, <laughs> normally this is how things would go. The Sorcerer's Kingdom has been providing aid to the Northern Holy Kingdom. If all went according to their plans, they would have an easily manipulated country in their hands. Should we try to contact the South? If it was the Northern Holy Kingdom that was maintaining amicable relations with the Sorcerer's Kingdom, then the South must view the Sorcerer's Kingdom as their enemy. If the Kingdom were to form an alliance with the South, it was possible they could contain the Sorcerer's Kingdom's efforts somewhat. That's true, it would certainly be a desirable development. 
There's another reason the two halves are against each other, namely the faceless progenitor's new teachings, that can't be good for the kingdom either. Ah, that one. The faceless one. A nickname for the proselytizer who showed up after the chaos caused by Jeldabiv. Though it appeared that her true name was made public, the nickname had already spread much further than her real name. Her teaching, treasured by her many followers, was that weakness without the drive to improve oneself is a sin, everyone must strive towards the goal of becoming stronger. That was more or less an understandable concept for most people. Though there was widespread support for her teachings in the north, it was not only unpopular but also shunned in the south. However, this was the predictable outcome. To the ruling class, that kind of mentality would only invite instability to those who are at the top. Perhaps that was the main reason why the nobles in the south, who still retained their authority, and the rapidly deteriorating north were at each other's throats. What was led by the faceless one was more of a community than a religion. Because of that, the four great gods were still being worshipped as usual, and problems with religious institutions never arose. At the same time, the newly crowned holy king gave his acquiescence to the group, further dividing the north and the south. By common sense, isn't it odd to hide one's face? Apparently the faceless one always appeared in public wearing a mask. The diplomatic mission sent from the kingdom had the same questions in mind as Anna concerning the faceless one, so they asked her followers. It did not matter who they asked, each and every one of their answers were vague at best, as if they would be breaking some form of taboo, should they have answered truthfully. It was incredibly suspicious. By hiding her face, is she not creating the impression that she had done something unspeakable in the past? Her parents were apparently renowned warriors. If she had revealed her face and preached out in the open, it would probably have raised her reputation by a fair amount. Is it possible that she's hiding her appearance because she's been lying about her heritage? Why would someone spread such a boring lie? I don't think any of the benefits of hiding one's appearance would apply to her if that's the case. That's true, or perhaps she's not human, but undead or something similar. You mean she's serving under the Sorcerer King? I just thought that if that were the case, things would start to make a lot more sense, wouldn't they? It could explain a lot of things, but why would someone like that risk arousing further suspicion from others, by hiding their appearance? That's also true, but what other acceptable reasons are there to hide one's appearance? It's also possible that she had received some form of facial disfigurement during Jaldabaoth's invasion, but then again it should have been treatable with magic. Unless wounds inflicted by a fiend as strong as Jaldabaoth cannot be healed with magic or something similar. Well, that's more believable than your previous theory, especially since she's female. Exposing a facial scar could be beneficial in the sense that people would sympathize with you more, but that's largely dependent on how severe the wound was. In any case, our first order was to gather detailed information on the inner workings of the Holy Kingdom. Let's plan our operations out in a way where we could immediately aid in the south, should that become necessary. That would be best. To our south is the Holy Kingdom, where half of the country is friendly to the Sorcerer's Kingdom, and to our east is the Empire, a vassal state of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. This will be hard to deal with. Yeah. Xanax's gaze remained affixed on Renner, who had been replying ever so nonchalantly. You make it sound so simple. Eh? But what more could be said about this? The situation is undeniably worse if you consider the current state of our neighboring countries. Other than what Onisama has said so far, there's also the matter of the persisting and prospering underground organizations in the kingdom. You're talking about the Eight Fingers, correct? Recently there have been a number of people making a mess all over the place due to narcotics withdrawal. So have they really become active again? If it wasn't for that archfiend Jeldabiath appearing out of nowhere, we could have knocked the Eight Fingers down another peg or two for sure. Xanax sighed. With the loss of Gaz of Stronoff, the strongest warrior in the kingdom, the government had shifted its policy to avoid direct confrontation with the Eight Fingers. They simply lacked the necessary number of strong individuals to deal with the issue. Except one. The man employed by Renner, Brain and Gloss, had a lot of potential. But, that man was only loyal to Renner, so there's probably no chance at all that he'd be willing to serve Xanax. He had already attempted to gain favor with him, but it did not seem to have an effect on him at all. I don't plan on taking on the role of warrior captain myself, so it's probably better to promote someone who's talented enough for the job. Should we train him to become someone who's worthy of the position of warrior captain? I wanted to at least give him the sword that's part of the kingdom's treasures, but father would never allow it. To his father, the king, Gaza Stronoff's existence was far too important. It's lonely at the top, as they say. Knowing that soon it'll be his turn to bear this burden, Xanak, unbeknownst to himself, is gradually grasping the true meaning of that proverb. As a person, Gaza Stronoff's existence was like that of a comforting bonfire to his lonely father. Despite the significant age difference between the two, one could say that they were closer than friends in some respects. For his father to have someone like that in his life, Xanak couldn't help but feel envious. As the second prince, Xanak had never experienced that level of friendship before. 
His older brother was the heir apparent for the longest time, so no one would bother forming that deep of a connection with someone who was simply a spare. They probably judged that it was not worth the risk of getting on Marquis Bulb's radar by befriending a future Archduke. The only one who'd keep in touch with him was Marquis Reven, presumably out of his concern for the kingdom's future. Even then their relationship was closer to that of mutual supporters than friends, as a result, Zanak had repressed quite a bit of the ensuing depression. Will he remain lonely for the rest of his life?